Welcome everybody to this uh, joint WIPO uh, AIPPI seminar, webinar. My name is Arne Holden. I'm the executive director of uh, AIPPI. These are indeed extraordinary times. The coronavirus has spread through the world and our thoughts are with all those affected. Switzerland, as most of the world, is currently on lockdown. The AIPPI General Secretariat in Zurich, as well as uh, WIPO in Geneva, had to close their offices and most employees are working from home. I am sure that many of you are also joining us from your homes. So although this webinar has been produced by professionals using the latest technologies, I can ensure you that it's, it is 100% homemade. Like a homemade cake, I'm sure that we can expect fresh food for thought and content that is served while still hot. AIPPI is currently, currently stepping up its digital presence through uh, new webinars, our social media channels, and our website so that we can all stay connected while staying at home. We are looking forward to roll out a new website and further educational online formats in the coming weeks. As for today, I'm delighted to welcome you to a premiere, a joint WIPO AIPPI webinar. We came up with this idea when we were discussing AIPPI's official annual visit at WIPO headquarters. These official annual visits are only one part of a very close and long-standing cooperation between AIPPI and, and WIPO that dates back to the creation of the WIPO in 1967. I'm very pleased to welcome five distinguished senior uh, WIPO staff members who will provide us with an update on the latest development in trademarks, designs, and GIs on the PCT Madrid and Hague systems, as well as on IP enforcement. The session will be moderated by AIPPI's report general, Mr. John Osha. There will be plenty of time for questions and answers, and all participants are encouraged to submit questions to our speakers. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Some of you have also submitted some questions via email. We will carefully select the questions and uh, depending on the number of questions, we will probably have to uh, uh, re reduce them to a few. Again, I would like to thank our speakers who kindly agreed to participate in this new format. And without further ado, I will now hand over to Tom Bombeles, Head NGO and Industry Relations at uh, WIPO. Tom, please. Thank you, Arno, and uh, welcome everyone. <clears throat> My name again is Tom Bombellis. I'm head of NGO and industry relations at WIPO. And as such, <clears throat> I'm one of the principal points of contact between the AIPPI secretariat and the organization. Uh, the purpose of today's meeting was uh, explained very well by Arno, and I want to be very brief, uh, just introducing the five uh, experts and colleagues um, by their names and titles. You have their bios, and <clears throat> we'll leave the rest of the time for the presentations and the interaction. One other point I want to make to all of you AIPPI members and as I have been discussing with Arno is, uh, of course, we're in a special period, as we all know, and it's uh, rather difficult, but to try to make the best of it, I just want to emphasize to all of you and to call to your attention that um, today's event does not have to be the last of its kind in the sense that we are very happy, my, uh, my colleague Christopher Ruggiero and I, to arrange further briefings for AIPPI and its members on other um, topics within the purview of WIPO um, at your request. So what we're all trying to do obviously is um, reconfigure our work plans um, and see what we can continue to deliver in terms of our objectives um, given, um, given the circumstances that we're all living in. So one, um, suggestion and open invitation to you, the AIPP members, is uh, if you have other issues that you want to be briefed on, or would you like to learn more about uh, in terms of WIPO's operations, services, et cetera, 
please uh, put them forward and we'll be happy to uh, arrange those and work on those with you. So thank you for that. And without um, further, uh, further taking up of much time, let me just say, um, as you see from the schedule, there are three um, main uh, subject categories this afternoon. Patents, which will be presented by Mr. Ken Natsume, Senior Director, PCT and uh, PCT Legal and International Affairs Department. Under the heading of Brands and Designs, we have Mr. Marcus Hopperger, Director, Trademarks, Industrial Designs and Geographical Indications. Mr. Gregoire Bisson, Director of the Hague Registry. Ms. Debbie Renning, Director of the Madrid Registry. And then we move on to the Building Respect for IP issue, uh, which will be Mr. Xavier Vermandele. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to an interesting afternoon. Thank you, Arno. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is John Osa. It, it's my uh, pleasure to uh, be the moderator of this session. And uh, without further ado, Ken, I would ask you to uh, proceed. Thank you very much, John, and thank you very much, colleagues, for the kind introduction. So uh, let me start with my great, great thanks to all of the colleagues for this opportunity and uh, this difficult situation. Uh, since we have to be efficient in the time management. So let me directly go into the presentation itself. And I have my stopwatch with me. So I try to do my best to <coughs> stick with the timeline. Okay, now I'm supposed to cover the update of the latest information about the PCT. Here is the maybe Many of you have already seen this kind of view graph. This is a geographical coverage of the PCT contracts in the states. We have currently 153 member states with the addition of one extra country in 2019, which was Samoa. And as you can see, uh, we see a wide coverage of blue area, which is covered by the PCT member states. So for those of you, who would like to seek the protection of your invention, these are the areas where you can enjoy our global service, PCT. However, of course, there are some gray areas which are not yet covered by the PCT. I have the list of the member states which are not yet in the PCT system. So for those who are interested in seeking your patent protection in these countries, please be careful because the PCT route is not available. So you have to go through the Paris normal route. And we are hoping that we could welcome more uh, possible participating in the member states, but under current situation, uh, we are not yet sure how the things would evolve, but we are making our effort continuously. This is the statistics which we have just released last week uh, by the director general in the according to the latest statistics in 2019 we have received almost 266,000 international pct applications with a growth rate of 5.2 percent this week also imf International Monetary Fund released the latest economic, world economic outlook, which included the world economic growth of 2019, that was 2.9%. So we happily saw this because we, uh, our growth rate ratio was more than the world economic growth, which is a good indication for the confidence with our PCT system. However, as you may be aware, the world economic outlook also included the projected uh, economic growth for this year, 2020, which is minus 3.0%. So this is quite significant and we are not yet sure how this would affect our global services However, we have to carefully monitor the situation. And as you know, many PCT applications come with the priority 
which means the actual PCT filing takes place around 12 months from the original filing date. So maybe affect could be a little bit later on, but we'll see how the situation evolves. This is also the latest uh, statistics of the top 10 countries of the PCT application in 2019. For the first time, China now at the top rank for the PCT application, surpassing the United States that have been on the top rank from the beginning of the history of the PCT, namely 1978. More than 22% are from China, almost 22% are from United States, close to 20% applications are from Japan. And as you can see, Almost 64% are from top three countries and almost 78% are from top five countries. And if we add up with 15 countries, it's covering 93%. And I'd like to mention the Asian region covers more than half. So the significance of the Asia as a source of the innovative activity is quite remarkable. Here is the top 10 applicants of the PCT in 2019. The top applicant was Huawei Technologies, followed by Mitsubishi Electronics, Samsung, Qualcomm, and so forth. As you can see, there are four companies from China two companies from the Republic of Korea, and one company from United States, Japan, Sweden, and Germany. So again, we can see the uh, major portion of the application from the Asian region. Here is the breakdown of the top five technical fields of the international application. The computer technology was the top, which is close to 9% for the by the digital communication, electrical machinery. Thanks to those technologies, I think we can do this kind of uh, webinar in the budget. And this is followed by the medical technology and measurement. And taking into consideration the current situation under COVID-19, probably uh, we might see more applications, international applications in this field as well. We'll see how the situation evolves. Let me touch upon the discussion amongst member states and users Every year we hold PCT working group in spring. And this year it was scheduled from May 26 to 29. However, under the current situation, it was decided that this meeting would be postponed. Taking this opportunity, let me touch upon a couple of points that member states were expected to discuss. One of the issues was the proposal for the amendments to the regulations, which is about the implementation of WIPO standards ST26. ST26 is a standard for the XM filing, especially for sequence listing. This is very important area. And we have been aiming at January 1, 2022, the actual as an actual implementation of this new standard. Though we do not have the PCT working group in May, uh, we continue to our effort to meet this target. It is likely that we will send out the circulars regarding this proposal and member state with a aim where the member states can finally 
reach upon agreement in the upcoming PCT assembly, which is scheduled in this September. Also, member states were expected to review the supplementary international search system, which have been in place for significant uh, number of years. And along with PCT working group, the member states was also, were also expected to discuss uh, in the Committee on Technical Cooperation about the possible appointment of the Eurasian Patent Office uh, becoming as an international authority. Eurasian Patent Office has submitted its application and it was supposed to be discussed to make an advice to the PCT assembly in September. And also we would like to keep our effort to maintain that agenda be rolling. So we are thinking of how we could do the preparatory work toward the assembly in September. Let me take this opportunity to touch upon the latest COVID-19 related issues. Last week, we have just released the dedicated page on PCT website for these COVID-19 issues. You see this link, or you can type it in, or you can copy paste in, but you can easily navigate yourself going to top wiper page and just click patents. Then you will see on top of the page, this box COVID-19 update, where you can click here and you have all the latest information related to COVID-19 related issues. And similar uh, pages are also available in the other uh, global services such as Madrid and The Hague. Couple of points I'd like to highlight here is, first is the, due to the difficult postal services availability to and from the Switzerland, we have decided to suspend our paper communication regarding PCT applications. So we no more send our communications in the form of paper and we strongly encourage the applicant attorneys to communicate us in the form of electronic means. In this sense, I would like to strongly recommend all the colleagues if not yet done, to think about our EPCT service, which is of course free of charge and available 24 seven with good security. And you can transact all kinds of information related to PCT, your PCT applications. Of course, you can file the application as well. And we have been receiving questions and contacts regarding what kind of remedies would be available if you are about to miss the deadline or if you have already missed the deadline, for example. And of course, there are issues with local IP offices. However, we also posted an article which include practical advice regarding possible remedies for example, if you pass the deadline, what kind of remedies are available in relation to PCT rules? And also, we have just released the interpretation of the International Bureau about a specific rule which deals with so-called force majeure situation in an emergency situation, I would say. And of course, this is an issue of the interpretation. The, our view, International Bureau's view is that current COVID-19 pandemic related situation is considered as a case for this emergency situation, natural calamity or other like reason. So for us, 
international bureau, we will take that into consideration in a favorable manner. So we could be as flexible as possible in order to uh, secure the right and benefit of the stakeholders. And we encourage, we have encouraged other IP offices and international authorities to act like that. Lastly, before I close my presentation, we have also released the crisis management dashboard yesterday. So this is brand new information. This is the latest information regarding how the operation of WIPO, especially WIPO services are going on. So with this monthly updated crisis management dashboard, you can have a look at how the International Bureau or how WIPO Secretariat is operating, working, even remotely, that we are doing very best effort and for those services such as PCT, Madrid and The Hague, we are op operating, functioning, uh, almost full-fledged side, and we are continuing to provide our services to the users. So I think now it's about five seconds before 15 minutes, so I'll stop here and I'm happy to have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, for that very informative update. And uh, thanks to you and all of your colleagues uh, for the excellent work that you're doing uh, to continue operations and provide guidance in this time of crisis. Uh, it's appreciated by, by all of us. Um, I have one general question uh, and then uh, several specific questions um, to, to ask to you. And I would like to remind everyone online that you can submit questions in writing using the Q&A at the bottom of the screen, and we'll take as many of them as we can. So starting with question one, um, you, you may be aware that uh, AIPPI does um, a number of study questions every year. One of the questions that AIPPI considered last year uh, was on the topic of whether plausibility should be considered as an independent patentability requirement. And that inquiry had, had three subparts, so to speak, uh, the, the issue of whether a claimed invention needs to be credible, um, how to treat speculative claims, and whether prophetic examples should be permitted. So AIPPI resolved that there should be no standalone ground of patentability based on plausibility. And with, with this in mind, how would WIPO treat an application having claims that appear to be speculative or that describes technical effects that appear to be implausible. Is there a de facto credibility or plausibility determination to be made? And if so, how would you measure it? Thank you very much, John, for the question. I think this is a very important and interesting question. And patent laws, as we, everybody knows, that require that the disclosure of an invention be sufficient enough to enable for a person skilled in the art to reproduce the invention. It also requires that claims shall be fully supported by the description or the specification shall contain a written description of invention. In exchange of disclosing such an invention, which becomes public domain later on, an exclusive right or a justifiable scope of patent protection can be enjoyed. Though it may be indirect, the plausibility issues may have an impact on the determination of inventive step and other patentability criteria. As everybody might know, the WIPO does not conduct substantive examination of patent application per se, including PCT application. We only do the formality examination. Having said that, PCT regulations and PCT International Search and Preliminary Examination Guidelines do include the provisions on sufficiency of disclosure and international searching authorities, international preliminary examining authorities are conducting their international search and examination with these rules. 
in line with that, let me touch upon three points, if I may, John and colleagues. First thing is the Standing Committee of Law Patents, SCP. While the, this Standing Committee's work is confined to a fact finding at this moment, the agenda of the SCP includes a number of substantive patent law issues, such as assessment of inventive step and sufficiency of disclosure. Based on the input received from the member states of WIPO, they will have done the studies on this subject matter that covers the underlying policies, laws, national and regional practices of the member states that were prepared and discussed in the committee. In relation to the sufficiency of disclosure, the study touches upon especially issues relating to mere speculation of possibilities, mere assumption of results, and predictability of variance covered by claims, and to the extent of generalization of claims. And the study in poor studies are available on WIPO website. And if interested, I can share the uh, URL of the studies uh, later on to the Secretariat of AIPPI so that uh, colleagues can have a look at that. Second point, if I may, uh, is about the artificial intelligence. I think one of the related field is the uh, emerging technology such as AI. In this area, WIPO has circulated the draft issues paper on IP policy and artificial intelligence with a view to welcoming comments from various stakeholders. And we had actually disclosure issues for patent as one of the key points. For example, what are the issues that AI assisted or AI generated inventions present for the disclosure requirement and so forth? And we have received more than 250 submissions and almost more than 90 submissions touched upon this issue. And we will revise the draft uh, paper and we will publish the updated one sooner. We have originally planned to hold the second session of the physical meeting in May, but now it has to be postponed. So we will see the when we can resume the session. Also, the Standing Committee of Patent SCP produced a background document, which includes the issue relating to the plausibility of AI-generated inventions. And member states have been discussing and share their views. Finally, very quickly, the five big offices, namely IP5, they have also been discussing this disclosure or written description of sufficiency of disclosure issue. They have done the uh, study based on the hypothetical case and they analyze the cases together with the industry and that report are also available online. So I can share the link later on. So I'll stop here then I can have further successive related questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, and indeed, I, I think uh, this is particularly uh, an important question with respect to AI related inventions and uh, hope that we can have further conversations on that topic in the future. My, my next question is from Luis Alfonso Duran of Spain. Um, and uh, it's, it's a little bit long, so I hope he'll permit me to paraphrase it. Uh, his question is uh, noting that uh, the COVID-19 problems that a company encounters um, apply not only to what's happening with the IP office in their country, but to all countries in the world where that company owns IP rights. And so he observes that approaching extensions of, of terms as the IP offices have been doing, taking into account their local health uh, conditions, uh, doesn't really take that into account, um, noting that uh, different offices are taking different steps. For example, the EPO extended terms until April 17 and EU IPO until May 1. Uh, so the question is, can WIPO, being a, a worldwide IP, IP organization um, and being a UN agency, lead a movement to promote a worldwide harmonized approach 
uh, to, for IP offices to take uh, during this special time. Thank you very much. This is a very valid, important and uh, question. I think probably there are two aspects. Uh, we have also received this kind of question and we are more than happy to be a facilitator, coordinator or a catalyst to have some unified or harmonized approach uh, uh, toward this situation because as you rightly mentioned, if their deadlines are different from country to country, that would cause some confusion and if that would make the situation even more complicated, which is not very much user-friendly at all. That's why we have just uh, released, as I mentioned in my last presentation, we have released uh, uh, the interpretation of current available uh, rule. In that uh, release, we have explicitly uh, mentioned that, for example, we will not issue the declaration where the PCT application is withdrawn until the end of May, and it could be extended further on. And for example, if the other countries can follow the same line, then that would be, uh, that could lead to the more harmonized approach. However, this is not legally binding. The other way is, of course, we can have some more say legally binding harmonized approach. Technically that can be done and we could think about it, but the challenge would be even though if we create a new rule or a new law, whatever new international treaty or anything like that, usually it has to be accepted or ratified in each jurisdiction, which could take some time. Sometimes they have to submit it to the diet or parliament and it could take additional month or year. And we cannot wait for that. So that's why as a first step, we release this interpretative statement as an international bureau so that at least we could encourage the member states and IP offices to look at the similar or ideally same direction so that we can have more coherent and harmonized approach. So that's the current situation, and we will do our effort more. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And if there's anything on the user side that we can do to support your efforts, please let us know. Uh, and likewise to the participants, uh, if you're aware of specific problems right now in your jurisdiction that are not being addressed, um, you know, please let us at AIPPI know, and and uh, we're happy to act as as your filter, so to speak, and and uh, try to put our forces together combined to, uh, to address these issues as, as well as we can, noting the practical limitations uh, that Ken has mentioned um, with, with respect to uh, getting actual laws passed. Um, my next question, Ken, uh, is referring to your slide about the top fields of technologies dominating uh, the international PCT applications, um, do you see any long-term trends in terms of upcoming new fields of technology and particularly with respect to AI, of course? Thank you very much. This is a very interesting question and uh, I have to be very careful because this is, <laughs> it's very hard to see. And so maybe this is, uh, this is not an official uh, uh, view of the organization. This is more like my personal impression, if I may. I think the computer technology and digital communication uh, continues to be the one or the very major aspects. Because if we think about the product, let's say mobile phone, that involves many technologies. So even in order to achieve this one mobile phone, probably you might need hundreds of patents. So that's why I personally believe this computer technology, digital communication, the number of patent applications would remain relatively high. Then if we think about, let's say, medicine, sometimes the one medication can be protected, very limited number of patents. Let's say if the, the one subset of medicine can be protected, one or two, one is the material and product, 
the other one is a method or a process. So in that sense, the impact of one patent application, one patent right is extremely big in the medical field. However, it doesn't necessarily mean that we will have huge number of patent applications in the medical technology. However, as briefly mentioned in my presentation, since now this uh, medical issue is a top priority, so I'm sure all the researchers in the field are rushing into the development of new technologies, new viruses, new method of the diagnostics. So I won't be surprised if we see the significant increase in this field as well. And we are here well, to- Thank you very much. Um, and uh, you actually answered another question that had been asked by one of our attendees. So that's wonderful. One of our attendees had asked uh, whether the epidemic will uh, result in additional filings in this area. So I think you answered that question. Um, thank you very much. This has been very informative. And uh, as we are out of time, um, I would ask uh, Marcus if you could uh, begin your presentation. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, John, and um, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, AIPPI members. It's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to speak on behalf of the brand and design sector of WIPO and to give you a brief overview on current issues in the area of progressive norm setting in brands and designs. The emphasis will be on brief because there's quite a good number of issues and I've been given 15 minutes. So my presentation, unfortunately, will not be able to go much beyond a listing of those issues with the relevant references, but uh, the references should enable all of the participants of this webinar maybe to then follow up themselves and maybe read up on those areas and issues which are of particular importance to them. Let me just share my screen here and then let's start. Okay. So the, um, the work in the area of what we refer progressive norm setting or progressive norm development as far as brands and designs are concerned is taking place in a technical committee that has been set up to that effect, namely the WIPO Standing Committee on the Law of Trademarks, Industrial Designs and Geographic Indications that should have held its 43rd session about a month ago. <laughs> But unfortunately, due to the circumstances we all are aware of, that didn't take place. The SCT, as you can see, was created in 98. And like the SCP for patents or the SCCR for copyright, it's intended to be a forum to discuss issues and to facilitate the coordination among our member states in the area of norm development on international law. And as far as the SCT is concerned, it's about trademarks, industrial designs, and geographic indications. And to give you a better idea of what's currently going on, I thought I'd just run you briefly through um, the agenda of SCT 43, which, as I said, unfortunately didn't take place. And I will break down uh, that presentation into the various subject matters, namely trademarks, industrial designs, and geographic indications. So I'm going to do it over 15 minutes, and then my colleagues, Gregoire and Debbie, will follow up with more specific information concerning the various registration systems that correspond to uh, designs in the uh, uh, Hague system and to trademarks in the Madrid system. And I myself will say a couple of words to the Lisbon system that is an international registration system protecting geographic indications. So as regards industrial designs, the SCT has been working for quite some time on a new draft international instrument, draft design law treaty, which is intended to become uh, an international treaty along the lines of what we already know in the area of trademarks for the Singapore Treaty on the Law of Trademarks or in the area of patents, the Patent Law Treaty. So it is a draft instrument that sets up certain harmonized and in particular simplified rules for the registration and the management of industrial design through design uh, registration systems or design patent systems as the case may be. Now the industrial design, the draft uh, uh, design law treaty has been more or less ready at a technical level, but um, there are a couple of issues that's holding it, holding it up 
to be sent to a diplomatic conference, and this is being currently discussed by the Bible General Assembly, who will revert to that matter in its meeting in uh, next uh, September, and hopefully we'll be able to uh, achieve uh, uh, an agreement and find solution to what is outstanding. So again, in the interest of time, I won't be able to give you more sort of detail of what really is holding up. It's quite a complex issue, but I'm more than happy to follow up either bilaterally or you know, in another forum organized by IPPI on that matter. And I should say, by the way, AIPPI obviously as an observer organization is following our meetings and is also accredited to follow the SCT discussion. So one area that is important to AIPPI understand because there's also a dedicated uh, resolution is the protection of graphic user interface designs or GUIs. And there are a number of issues that came up when it comes to GUI protection or icon or typeface, type font design protection. And the standing committee has been working in that area for quite some time. It has run a number of surveys amongst its members so to get a better understanding of how these designs are being protected and what, if anything at all, stands in the way between more efficient protection of GUI designs in particular. Um, so here I would like to refer you to the questionnaire and analysis that has been presented in document SCT 41.2 REF and in particular 43.2, which was supposed to be presented in March, but we couldn't, which is a very interesting document that presents an analysis of GUI protection in our member states. Those members that have responded in particular point out whether they protect GUI designs via a design patent system or via a registered industrial design protection system. And following on then, there are a number of more specific questions, particularly tailored to design patent systems, in particular, such as the necessity to link your GUI design to a physical article, which apparently in the past has caused some problems. And um, there's also a proposal out there by the delegations of the United States of America and Japan that addresses um, some potential shortcomings of uh, design protection for GUIs. It's presented in 42.6, and it aims at an, at, uh, an international declaration or recommendation rather by the Weibo General Assembly that would clarify certain matters relating to GUI protection, such as in particular that famous link between the physical product and the graphic user interface. Now, this is all very, very abstract for those in particular who haven't looked into it. But uh, it, I mean, Ken mentioned before uh, uh, the issue of patent protection for uh, smartphones or mobile phones. And obviously, today's mobile phone is no longer a telephone. No, it's, it's a held, held, a handheld. IT device that enables us to do, do many, many things. Uh, least of all is probably making telephone conversations. Uh, and all of that is being operated through graphic user interfaces. And here, if you go down the design pattern road, you know, you have to identify, no, your interface is that for a camera, for a dictaphone, for a, uh, for a GPS, <laughs> for a, communication device, you know, you have potentially hundreds of different apps on your mobile phone that really go far beyond uh, a simple description as a handheld device. So you can see a little bit of the challenges that are here and we're trying to, to address those, those issues at the SCT. Um, a bit unrelated to GUI designs, but the other of importance is the question of temporary protection for industrial designs under Article 11, Paris Convention, one of them oldest and you could say uh, most ancient provisions within the Paris Convention. One of the reasons why the Paris Convention back in 1883 actually was negotiated and adopted, namely to provide temporary protection for certain inventions, designs, trademarks, etc., shown at international, at international exhibitions. And, you know, the question of how this provision is being implemented with regard to industrial designs by our member states and the contracting parties to the Paris Convention is an open question. And again, we run a survey among member states. How do you provide your temporary protection industrial designs on the Article 11 Paris Convention? And in particular, what constitutes an international exhibition that would qualify under your national law? Uh, 
for the application of Article 11. So all that has been, the information has been collected, it's presented in 42.2, and the plan actually was to hold a half-day information session uh, as, a, as an integral part of the SCQ meeting to present the findings of um, the survey and to have users and patent offices present their particular views on, on that issue. Now, unfortunately, that information session had to be postponed as it be, and we will, we hope we'll be able to very soon uh, come up and uh, with, a, with, a, with a solution to that and present information session, see whether there is some area for further development uh, of the application of Article 11 of the Paris Convention. So time's running and so am I going on to trademarks and here uh, a topic that has been discussed for quite some time is the protection of country names and geographical names of national significance and if you talk about protections negative protection namely against the unauthorized or unlawful registration or use as trademarks so I, the idea here is no is there something that ought to be done to prevent individual um, parties from registering and obtaining exclusive rights in trademarks that consist of country names and here we have a brand new proposal by a group of countries and a list of the countries here don't I'm going to read them out. And uh, that again was supposed to be presented at, 40, at SED 43. Unfortunately, it couldn't take place. The proposal actually puts forward uh, um, an initiative to say we want to propose that the WIPO General Assembly adopts a recommendation for an examination guideline for trademark officers under which applications for certain types of trademarks consisting of country names should be rejected. It's a nutshell, obviously, the explanation in a nutshell, so it's more nuanced and more detailed. And those of you who are interested, please refer to document 436. It's all available online. And then there's a second, if you like, uh, layer to this debate on, on uh, protection of country names, and that is the protection of country names and names of a certain geographical significance, not against unauthorized registration of trademarks, but within the, the domain name system, in other words, as a delegation as top level domains or second level domains. And this is a work that interfaces very tightly with work that's going on with, within ICANN and the Government Advisory Commission of ICANN. And again, a certain number of countries, here they are, have proposed that WIPO should issue a recommendation to ICANN. Um, and then that recommendation, the delegation of certain country names as generic top level domains should uh, be prevented. This is a work in progress. There are different views on that proposal and it's not unanimously supported. And again, was supposed to be discussed at the ICT at the ICT's last session. And finally, the ICT is also considering a new initiative, which is being based on the proposal by the delegation of FEDU. And it uh, deals with the protection of nation brands and that obviously is a very interesting issue because nation brands are not defined really internationally so the question is what are nation brands how are they being used and is existing IP protection for nation brands sufficient or not and what's happening as in with the other projects before we can in, engage in some you know, further discussion let's do some fact finding and we've just been working on a survey which will be out uh, hopefully soon under which we will try to collect information that will enable the um, SCT at its next session to, to better consider that proposal and to see whether you know, there is a need for for example international definition of nation brands and scope of protection or whether indeed the existing IP system in particular trademark protection and for competition etc is sufficient for nation brand protection. Okay, in a nutshell, that's trademarks. I'm running and moving on to geographic indications. Now, geographic indications is, is a very emotional topic and many of you will be aware that there are different approaches to the protection of geographic indications. And um, in 2015, an international diplomatic conference took place here in Geneva that led to the adoption of a new act to the Lisbon Agreement for the protection of uh, geographical indications. I mean, to be very precise, the existing Lisbon Agreement is called the 1958 Lisbon Agreement for the Protection of Appellations of Origin and their International Registrations, and that was uh, revised through the Geneva Act 
now for the uh, or the clear back of the Lisbon Agreement for the protection of geographic indications and appellations of origin. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, aside from the work on the Geneva Act or the Lisbon Agreement, the Standing Committee has been has continuously been engaged in exchanging uh, information and views on protection of geographic indications, and that is being reflected in particular in two big questionnaires that were run and uh, resulted in surveys that helped us to collect information on geographic indication protection at the national level. And here I really would very strongly advise you, those of you who are interested in geographic indication protection, to have a look at the geographic indication database that we created based on the returns to those two surveys, which is a very, very complete collection of very specific national and regional data relating to the protection of geographical indications such as we know, you know, for wine, spirits, cheeses, etc., etc., but not geographical, sorry, not certain regional specialities as are being uh, protected under the system of the, of the European Union in particular. So questionnaires, uh, results, and we have those, this database, and I put the link here on my slide, which is a very, very useful resource for those of you who want to research in more detail the question of GI protection at, at the national level. So I mentioned the, the Lisbon Agreement, and uh, or before I go there, I also should have said that the, the Standing Committee on the Law of Trade and Industrial Designs and Geographic Indications, the SCT, has identified a way also to engage in an informal exchange of views and information concerning uh, geographic indications and this is being done in the form of informal information sessions that are being held back to back with the SCT and there was one scheduled also for March and that, should, that information session was supposed to consider two issues, namely the conditions that created the basis for geographic indication protection in the first place and how to evaluate the change of such conditions. It's a very, very technical, technical matter. But what really is behind is the famous link between, on the one hand, your GI, and on the other hand, your area of production. And if you notice that over time, the area of production for specific GIs will grow, the question is, now what are the, what are the specific conditions under which the extension of these production areas can be uh, reviewed, evaluated and judged. And is it really okay that if you say my product has a specific quality that is due to its origin in a particular area, that that area over time you know, doubles and triples in its size. So this underlies a little bit uh, that debate. And then there's a second, a second debate on what are the ways to prevent operators from bad face registration of geographic indications, domain names? So in other words, uh, we have a system to, to, to challenge bad face domain name registrations that use trademarks, namely the famous UDRB, but that UDRB is limited, as we all know, to trademarks. And the question is, shouldn't that be extended to, for example, geographic indications? It's a long-standing debate, various views, and uh, that was supposed to take place this information session to shed some light on that. Um, I hear John, you have, I think I have another three minutes, John, correct? Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, you, you have a minute at this point, and okay. please try to stay close to the microphone because you're fading in and out a bit. Sorry, yeah, it's, it's my headset. Um, now, the, um, I, would, I thought what would be very interesting, just to sort of round this up, is to give you a, 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 an idea of um, how many GIs there are around the world, because we spent I'm on GI debates in the SCT, in the Lisbon Union, World Trade Organization, among other areas, bilaterally. But uh, it's quite revealing that there are not that many GIs, really. And this is uh, uh, an excerpt from our annual uh, IP statistics. And you will see that uh, there are not much more than about 60, 65,000 GIs around the world that are being protected. So it's a relatively, relatively limited number if you compare that to the 14 million trademark applications we saw in 2019. And most of those GIs are, not most, but a good, a good portion of those GIs are being protected from wines and spirits, uh, agricultural foodstuffs, and a small portion for other products. And you see that within Lisbon, there is still a very, very discreet number of, of, of appellation of origin registers, some thousand, with France being the champion holding 
about half of them. So um, the 2015 Geneva Act, and this is my last two minutes here, entered, and I think it's important to note, entered into force this year on February 26. It entered into force with the ratification of four or five contracting parties, namely Albania, Cambodia, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Samoa, and most importantly, the EU as an intergovernmental organization. So all 27 EU member states are now integral part of the Lisbon Agreement. And under this Geneva Act, we saw a broadening of the subject matter scope, so protection not only for populations of origin, but for populations of origins and geographic indications, explicit safeguard for prior rights and generic terms, which is a very, very important point, and also very strict due process provisions for that apply to newly uh, registered um, GIs. This concludes what must have been the fastest ever presentation of a SCT agenda. So thank you very much for bearing with me. And uh, in case there are some questions are available, obviously, and would be very happy to entertain those. And uh, back to you, John. Marcus, thank you very much for that world, whirlwind tour. Uh, we, we could have spent uh, an hour or more on that easily. So a uh, great job in, in collapsing that into 15 minutes. Uh, we're gonna listen, have all three of the speakers under uh, the brands and design sectors uh, speak, and then we'll take the questions at the end. Uh, so Gregoire, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, John. And uh, good morning to you, John. Good afternoon to everyone. Good evening to some of you. Let me perhaps start uh, by extending uh, a, a special greeting to the uh, members of the AIPPI Turkey. Um, because I was scheduled to speak at an AIPPI Turkey design event some two weeks ago, but that unfortunately had to be postponed for obvious reasons. So special greetings to um, the, the folks there. Um, let me perhaps uh, switch on to my, um, to my presentation. Um, here we go. Um, I intend to be relatively compact today. Um, so bear with me as I race through my slides. Um, I just want to provide uh, uh, the audience uh, with a quick update on the Hague system. Uh, I will be saying a few words about uh, 2019, then I'll move on about uh, the geographical expansion of the Hague system, and then I'll be saying a, a few words about the ongoing developments. So first, 2019, facts and figures. It was a very good year, 2019, for a number of reasons. Uh, first, we started the year with an important rule change uh, that made the appointment of representative uh, easier. In a nutshell, when an, a representative files an application, it is sufficient that that representative signs the form without attaching a power of attorney. Uh, and since we've introduced that rule change uh, on January 1st of last year, uh, we, we saw a, 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 a major drop in the number of uh, irregularity letters that we needed to issue. So that was a, indeed a very much welcome amendment. In terms of filing, at the end of the year, we observed that we had had quite a successful year with a 10% increase in designs filed uh, with us and a new record indeed, or close to 22,000 designs uh, had been filed under the Higgs system. Uh, where, uh, where were these designs coming from and, and for which uh, classes? Uh, well, we saw there an, an, an interesting, uh, some interesting new trends. Classes 14, 6, and 12 uh, were the top three classes in 2019. Now, class 14 is the one uh, that pairs uh, the antiquated label of uh, uh, recording and communication equipment. Uh, uh, since the turn of the millennium, it was mostly used for mobile phones. And as we saw more recently, it's mostly used for GUIs uh, that uh, Marcus uh, uh, mentioned earlier on. So it's quite a fast growing area uh, under the Hague system as well. Uh, class six is of course furniture and that is largely driven driven by solid usage in Europe. Uh, and class 12 is for vehicles, and that is still largely driven by solid usage in Europe, uh, and apparently uh, strong growth from France, but as well from Korea. And that allows me to move to the uh, uh, geographical sources of those filings in 2019. And uh, whilst most of the design, or whilst the top origin still was Germany, 
uh, and it's been the case for years on, uh, uh, the countries from which we saw the strongest growth were China, Korea, Italy, and, and the UK. Uh, there was a slight decrease in the US and, and as well uh, from Japan, uh, but what we've noticed with great satisfaction in respect of both the USA and Japan is that whilst the numbers were uh, lower in 2019 than in 2018, uh, we've seemed to have expanded the user base. So in other words, uh, we received slightly less designs from these jurisdictions, but they were coming from a wider number of individual applicants. Um, also, the very good news regarding 2019 is that refusals were down whilst uh, grants of, ref uh, of protection were up. Uh, and, and that shows that, you know, the system really is working. And particularly, we've receiving, we um, have had more and more what we call success stories. What we mean by that is, is uh, applications designating um, uh, various uh, examining jurisdictions, so jurisdictions where the, uh, the design office would be carrying out a substantive examination and, and a novelty examination of the designs filed. And, and we saw may, uh, a growing number of, of cases that have passed muster with all the offices. Uh, so I think that's an important message because initially when examining jurisdictions started uh, joining the system, and that's a very fairly recent phenomenon uh, with the uh, First Republic of Korea joining in 2014 and then the USA and Japan and more recently Canada Russian Federation um, and th there was strong skepticism as to whether the system would indeed allow someone to cover all these territories with success and and so the proof is in the pudding we have a growing number of cases that do designate uh, uh, a series of such jurisdictions and that receive grants of protection from these jurisdictions and the example i've shared on the slide here is probably our champion um, this application designated 35 jurisdictions and received grants of protection uh, from 34 jurisdictions including japan and Korea. Um, this is, folks, the um, the world according to the Higgs system. So it's not uh, everything that you see in blue is currently uh, Higgs coverage under the Geneva Act of 1999, and it's not as widespread as the Madrid system, let alone the PCT. But it's a fast-growing system. Uh, we currently have 74 current parties to the Higgs system, and uh, it, which represents 89 national jurisdictions being covered. And everywhere where you see uh, a uh, the checker pattern of white and blue uh, are jurisdictions where uh, there's concrete there are concrete legislative and diplomatic steps undertaken towards acceding. Um, so uh, the, the slide is, a, the map is a bit busy. Uh, some of these countries are admittedly small. So let me perhaps run you to a list. Uh, in terms of recent accessions, and what I mean by recent is really those that came into force uh, to, uh, in the last two years or that will come into force very soon. Um, we see, uh, you see that we've uh, included Canada recently, uh, but those that you see in blue, Israel, Mexico, Samoa, and Vietnam are more precisely uh, countries that just joined this year. In the case of Mexico, the um, uh, 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 the accession will become effective on June 6 uh, this year, so it's not there yet. Uh, but with the addition of Canada and, of course, the presence of the USA, that means that we've got the whole, uh, the whole uh, North American ter uh, territory covered. Also important in the Brexit context is the fact that the UK uh, has joined uh, almost two years ago. Uh, and Vietnam was also a long expected uh, accession. Now moving to the list on the right, if I may, these are pot potential accessions uh, for uh, uh, the, the, the next couple of years, for 2020 and 2021. Uh, uh, obviously, some of these countries are, are small jurisdictions, small markets, uh, uh, but other are uh, large and very large indeed. China, uh, uh, last time we had an exchange with uh, our interlocutors from China, uh, uh, they, they gave us the indication that they were expecting the instrument of accession to be deposited in the second quarter of 2020. Now, of course, uh, given the current circumstances, uh, we understand that the government uh, probably had to put this 
important file on the back burner, but uh, we expect China to join this year nonetheless. Uh, uh, additionally, other, uh, other large markets are Kazakhstan, uh, Indonesia, very, very important market, uh, especially for users um, in, in Japan and, and Korea. Uh, there are more countries considering joining, but we do not like, expect them uh, to join uh, 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 in this horizon of time. Uh, now, about ongoing developments, uh, if I may. Uh, well, first, very recently, uh, in January of this year, we made it possible for Hague applications to, or for your Hague applications, to be uploaded in the digital access service. I think it bears uh, recalling, John, that the, uh, the contrary to the PCT, contrary to uh, the Madrid system, uh, uh, the Hague system is, is very much used as a first filing system. And that is indeed the best way to use uh, the system is to not designate her, uh, I'm sorry, not file locally in your home jurisdiction, but uh, designate your home jurisdiction alongside the export markets. Uh, so a lot of folks are using the Hague system in that way. And But then if should you want to uh, go uh, outside of the Hague system uh, and claim priority from uh, your Hague application, you can do that. And by allowing uh, you to upload your Hague application into DAS, we'll make it, making it easier for you to, uh, to claim priority in those uh, non-Hague jurisdictions. Uh, this year also we uh, resumed talks with uh, the UK IPO concerning what would happen to uh, your, um, your titles under the Hague system at the end of the transition period, which is still currently planned for December 31st of this year. We're uh, working together with UKIPO, uh, UKIPO towards ensuring that uh, we can do this in the most favorable, favorable, favorable way uh, for users. Um, now, uh, uh, we will be holding the General Assemblies of WIPO in September hopefully. Uh, there's a number of important topics uh, for adoption by the Hague Union Assembly in particular. Uh, one is yet another important rule change that this one concerns changes in ownership. Uh, we again want here to uh, lower the threshold of formalities and particularly the proposal is that it would be sufficient for the um, request for the recording of a change in ownership to be uh, to be accompanied by an assignment document if it is signed not by the assigner uh, but rather by the assignee and uh, if that uh, amendment is adopted, that it should come into force on January 1st, 2021. Um, there's also a proposal uh, to hike up the fee for additional designs. Uh, uh, currently, that fee is very, very, very small. It's 19 Swiss francs. It, it has been the case since uh, 1996, I think. So it's high time it be reviewed. So we got the blessing of the Hague Working Group towards uh, making a proposal uh, uh, for the, that fee to be increased to 50 Swiss francs. It seems like quite a jump, but in fact, when you're putting that in the global picture of the fees and associated uh, agent fees uh, uh, co concerned, uh, we're really talking about a very, very small increase indeed. And again, that should be, should it be adopted by the assembly, it should come into force on January, 20, uh, January 1st, 2021. Uh, there's also a proposal for a new provision that would allow an applicant to uh, uh, add a priority claim after filing the Hague application. Uh, yeah, this is based uh, on a similar provision under the PCT and it should come into force not on January 1st, but at the later date to be confirmed. Now, we also have a working group uh, for the legal development of the Hague system, very much like the PCT, uh, as Ken mentioned. Uh, currently, the session is planned, it's still planned for December 14 to 16. I think it's important that AIPPI be represented. Uh, it had been the case uh, in the past. It wasn't the case, the case uh, at, the, uh, at the last session that we held, unfortunately, and I urge AIPPI to, to send representation there. 
uh, I know the uh, PPI design team is extremely strong. You have leaders there and would be extremely useful uh, if you could be represented there again. Um, the topics for consideration for the working group are uh, uh, the language regime. We're under pressure to expand that. An ongoing rev fee review. We're also under pressure by member states to, to revisit our fees in general. And Perhaps the last point, which is the most important, is a standard publication time. Currently, it's six months. So as you know, in those jurisdictions where they do not allow you to defer your application, you can still benefit from standard publication, which would happen six months after your, your date of registration. Uh, the objective was to put you in the same shoes that if you had filed domestically. With experience, it appears that this standard period of six months is too short. Uh, at the last uh, session of the working group, had proposed to extend it to 12 months. There was major backing from all offices and from the four user groups involved, but there was resistance from one office and, uh, and that office required that we further consult the uh, NGOs about this to make sure that the whole IP community was in favor of this. So we intend to do this through consultations that will be launched uh, later this year in the, in the spring or summer. But again, it's important that the IPPI make its voice heard in this, that context. My last slide, in those difficult times, how can you reach us? But first, let me uh, say, uh, Ribono, what Ken said, uh, we're fully operational. We have examiners, all examiners are looking at your applications from home and processing them uh, as normal. Uh, should you need to get back to us, however, do not use the telephone line, but use the contact Hague um, uh, uh, link that you see on our Hague page. And you can also use that with a view to submitting document to us. There's an upload document uh, feature there that you should be uh, using. Do not use uh, standard mail, please, as uh, uh, the, the, these are uh, no longer operational. That was my last slide. Sorry for running to this, but um, questions will be welcome during the um, welcome uh, we, during the question session. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, back to you, John, if I may. Roar, thank you very much for that exhaustive and informative tour of the Hague system. And thank you also for the invitation to participate in the working group. We certainly do intend uh, to be there in December. So thank you for that. Um, and Debbie, uh, you now have the floor. Thank you, John. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It is my pleasure to give you the latest update on what has happened in the Madrid system. Let's see if I can get this running. So, currently we have 106 contracting parties. Uh, these contracting parties cover 122 countries. And the reason why these numbers don't match is that we have two intergovernmental organizations as members, the EU and the OAP. And all their members are not individual members of the Madrid system. We had a very good year last year with three major countries exceeding the system. And these are Brazil, Canada, and Malaysia. This is what the, the current map of the Madrid members look like. We don't really have as many colored countries as the PCT, but eventually we hope to. So the countries marked in red indicate their members. So you can see that we need more members, need more colors in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia, and in the Arabic region. And this is coming. We are currently working with more than 20 countries that find themselves in the various stages of preparing for future accessions. Some of these are now at quite advanced levels, and we expect that a number of the countries will join within the next one, two, or three years. And the countries that we believe are the closest to accessions would be South Africa. There will be a big market for many trademark owners. In the Arabic region, we're working with Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. In Asia, we're working with Bangladesh, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. Malta has indicated that they will join the Madrid system this year, but they won't necessarily have much impact since they're already covered by the EU as a member. 
And in the Caribbean, we are working with Trinidad and Tobago. So hopefully this map will be looking a little bit different within the next few years. These are the newly released statistics. We had an exceptional good year last year, another record year for the Madrid system with more than 64,000 international applications coming in. Among our top filers, we have L'Oreal with 189 applications, followed by Novartis and Huawei. And for the first time, we have applicants from China and India on our top five list of applicants. Looking at where these applicants come from, this is based on the address of the applicant. Most of our applicants come from the US, followed by Germany and China. And then later France, Switzerland, UK, Japan, Italy, and Australia and Turkey. So these are the top 10 countries based on the address of the applicant. If you're looking at where do they seek protection? This is the other side of the coin. This is the list of the top 10 designated contracting parties. And on top of the list, we have the EU, followed by China, US, Japan, Russian Federation, Australia, Switzerland, UK, Republic of Korea, and India. And on this list, the UK is the only European country that is individually on the list that are also members of the EU. And this is because of the Brexit. They have been designated quite a lot in the recent years. Looking at the latest developments, we had some minor legal changes that entered into force on February 1st this year. The common regulations have now changed name to regulations under the protocol. And this is to reflect the fact that the protocol is the sole governing treaty of the Madrid system. So we have taken out common and all references to the agreement. Brexit has happened. As my colleague Gregoire mentioned, the transitional period is until December 31st, 2020. The withdrawal agreement between the EU and the UK covers what happens with the CTM rights. And we, the Madrid system, as long with um, the Hague registry, are discussing with the UK on what will happen with international registrations covering designations of the EU. We have information on our website concerning Brexit and some frequently asked questions. So if you're looking into more on this, please visit our website. We are currently scheduled to have our Madrid Working Group meeting uh, in June this year. It has not um, been confirmed, but we're still planning ahead. We have some interesting topics on the agenda for this year. We have some proposed amendments to the common regulations. One important one will be to make it mandatory to provide an email address when you fill out an international application or a request for a change. This will allow us to have a full electronic communication with our users. We will be discussing replacement in the context of allowing for partial replacement. We will have discussion paper on provisional refusals where we look into some of the challenges that users are facing today with the time limits to respond to provisional refusals being set by the various offices in line with the domestic legislation. And also that officers calculate the starting point of the time limits differently. And this causes a lot of problems for the users. So we're looking into this. We also have a discussion paper on dependency, you know, the five year dependency period. We are, as the Madrid and the Hague system is also discussing, um, the possible introduction of new languages to the Madrid system. We currently have English, French, and Spanish, and there is a proposal on the table to introduce Arabic, Chinese, and Russian as well. If you want to learn more about these issues, visit our website, and as soon as the documents are 
ready, we will publish them on our website. Then coming back to COVID-19, and this will be to supplement what my colleagues Ken and Gregor has talked about as well. We have suspended the postal service for WIPO, so you, WIPO is not currently able to neither receive nor send communications to our users via postal mail. So we have to rely on electronic communication. So if you have not yet provided WIPO your email address so we can communicate with you, please do this as soon as possible. This is very important. I cannot stress this enough. If you have an international registration and you have designated offices and you're waiting for their decision, they will have to send their decision if it is a provisional refusal through WIPO. And we will need to forward this to the holder. And if we cannot send this out through email, it will basically be put on hold for now. Some of these offices, as I mentioned, will calculate the time limits from when they send the refusal to WIPO. So it is important that you make sure that we have your email address so we can communicate with you when we receive decisions. We have published information on our website on time limits and possible relief measures if you are affected by COVID-19. We also have a dedicated Madrid webpage on this issue. And here we will put up all the information we receive from offices. We publish information notices from offices if they tell us that they are closed for the duration of the closure or if they're extending the time limits. So this is an important website to be aware of. If you need to provide us your email address, please use the Contact Madrid page if you have questions. Please use also this page to send us your questions. And I think this was rushing through the information, but at least you will have time for some questions now. Thank you. Debbie, thank you very much for that update. I have one very practical question. Um, presumably, you don't want everyone to submit their email address to you uh, if, if you already have it. Is, is there a way to verify that uh, you have, uh, that our uh, email address is, is correctly on file? For, for users um, of international Madrid system, I think it's important to make sure that you have the Madrid Portfolio Manager that you use our tool to manage your rights. And if you have that, you have provided your email address. But you can also see whether, if you have provided an email address in either an international application or a request for change, we will be using that to communicate with you. So if you already re if you don't receive postal communications from us, that would mean that you have to provide us an email address. And if you send a question through Contact Madrid, we will verify for you. Okay, thank you very much. Then um, I, I have a question relating to, to GUIs. Um, GUIs play an integral part in uh, all of our daily lives. Um, yet from the user side, uh, um, there's still considerable lack of clarity um, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction as to how to best protect GUIs and, and under which form of IP rights. Now, AIPPI passed a resolution in 2017 uh, supporting protection of GUIs under all of patents, trademarks, copyrights, and designs in appropriate circumstances. Uh, with respect to designs, AIPPI's resolution asserts that design protection should be possible without requiring connection to a physical device. Um, and with respect to both trademarks and designs, the resolution asserted that movements and transitions should generally be capable of protection. Now, in light of what we've heard uh, today about what's being done uh, in SCT, uh, could you comment on protection of GUIs in general and specifically on these two issues of connection to a physical device and protection of movements and transitions? And I address that generally to anyone uh, who would like to answer it. Uh, thanks, John. Well, let me, let me jump in here, maybe to start out and maybe uh, Grégoire can then complement it from the point of view of, of the Hague system, which uh, as you've seen provides for the, the practical steps for protecting GUIs. Um, the landscape is really diverse when it comes to GUIs that, that we have seen and I think this is also being confirmed by the work of AIPPI. Uh, the good news is GUIs are being protected and our latest uh, 
our latest uh, survey seems to confirm that. No? The difficulty, however, is that there are various ways of doing it. And even within the industrial design world or the realm of industrial design, we know very well that you have two different worlds. One is the design patent world and the other one is the registered design world. And it seems that uh, GUI design protection, the registered design world is a relatively straightforward matter. So there we don't have much of uh, feedback or, or much comment on, on, on this area. It seems to be that there is more there are more challenges when it comes to design pattern protection for GUI designs, in particular, uh, when it comes to the connection to a physical device and the claims and also the representation and moving GUIs and all these sort of things. So I think the, uh, the, the proposal by the delegations of the United States of America and Japan to the SCT and ultimately to the WIPO General Assembly shows a little bit the direction uh, where this could move, namely to identify certain uh, flexibilities in particular in the design patent protection system that would cater towards uh, the protection of certain features of the GUI designs, in other words, to make it uh, uh, more accessible, quicker, uh, quicker available and um, more, more effective when it comes to the actual protection of, of those designs. So, in essence, we have a, a rather fractured landscape. There's no one size fit all approach. It is really very much country by country. And uh, and as we have seen, even, even trademark protection is, is, is an option. And why not under the competition of copyright as well? So, um, so said, the good news is the means are out there. The bad or so not so good news is, is that, you know, it, 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 there's no common approach to the system throughout jurisdictions, but um, right owners might well have to, you know, find the best way to take um, design protection in the jurisdiction concerned. But as far as design patent protection is concerned, there's work underway with a, with a proposal by Japan and the U.S. to the WIPO General Assembly, maybe to, to identify certain solutions that would provide more leeway for this type of protection. So, <laughs> summarizes the situation, I think, as far as the SED is concerned. John, uh, with thanks Thank to you. Marcus, if I, if I may help on this as well by giving the Hague perspective, uh, I think indeed that um, this existence of a fractured landscape that uh, uh, Marcus aptly described uh, encapsulate uh, the best example of um, uh, what would undermine uh, the efficiency of the Higgs system as an international procedural uh, vehicle for getting protection. In indeed, it would be extremely unfortunate if users uh, filing uh, in various jurisdictions under the Higgs system were to be met by different results. Uh, from offices uh, uh, in respect of, of GUIs. Um, so I think it's it's very important that uh, uh, somehow uh, at the substantive level, there's some conversions as to what are, you know, the requirements for the protection of GUIs as, a, as industrial designs. Um, and perhaps uh, I, I would also say that I think the situation globally is improving. Uh, our observations are only empirical. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we do receive a growing number of Hague applications for GUIs. Um, in the past, such applicants tended to be extremely selective and careful in their choice of jurisdiction. So they would often designate only the EU and Switzerland and one of the examining jurisdictions, but not two or three. Um, and, uh, but the results have been, and again, it's an empirical observation, uh, have been positive in the sense that even in that examining jurisdiction that they would have selected in the given case, there was a grant of protection. Uh, 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 and lately we've noticed that people were less shy and tended to uh, designate more broadly. So hopefully they will be met equally with success. Uh, because again, the Hague system is very permissive at this level. You can file for a GUI without showing uh, the physical product. And that's perfectly fine by us uh, according to our formal standards and, uh, and requirements. Uh, but it's important also that, uh, you know, substantively it is also uh, something that is recognized by the examining jurisdictions. So it's, 
I think it's going the right direction. Hence the importance of the work taking place in the SCT, hence the importance of the work taking place as well in the ID5, uh, because this is a, an issue that the ID5 uh, officers are discussing amongst themselves. They're fully aware of, uh, of the importance uh, of the issue. And I think it's also, uh, uh, it underscores the importance of your work, the IPPI. I think it's important, again, that uh, your voices be heard. I don't think that Marcus and I have yet that touched upon the second of the uh, of the question, which are moving designs, you know, or evolving designs, um, and, and that's again a completely different uh, uh, game here. Um, I know that uh, five six years ago, in the HIC context, we made a proposal for uh, uh, allowing applicants to file moving files or moving designs, um, and there was a major pushback from offices because they said, we're not ready to grant protection to these. Uh, um, and uh, it was, the conclusion was it would be put back in the agenda of the Hague Working Group in the future. Uh, but again, I think that on such issues, you know, cutting edge issues, I think it's important that NGOs take the lead. You represent the IP community, you represent the users. Uh, if you think there's a need, there's a demand for this, it has to be heard, it has to be coming, you know, from, from the NGO, the user groups, and that would probably, you know, uh, uh, give more confidence to, um, to our member states. Uh, uh, that's all I had wanted to say about this. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, we'll 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 take that advice and continue the pressure on the moving designs point, uh, and hope we can move forward on that in the future. Um, I have a, a question here presented online from Nahid Abukas. I'm sorry if I got the name wrong, but it's very practical and timely. Um, I think it's for you, Gregoire. Again, um, would epidemiological test strips uh, be the subject potential subject of industrial designs? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure exactly what uh, such a strip is. I can I can imagine perhaps. Uh, uh, but but listen, um, I'm, 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 my answer would be somewhat disappointing in the sense that under the Hague we will take whatever complies with a formal requirement. So to, to the extent that you're able to show something that is a product, and again it could be just you know uh, a, a, a an image. Uh, uh, it doesn't have to be a physical project, but to the extent that you comply with our formal requirements, we would be taking your application and processing it and recording it, publishing it. Uh, I guess uh, the real question is, is this something that is capable of protection under the different various uh, substantive laws? And, and, and this, I don't have an answer to this, unfortunately. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And, um, <clears throat> We noted in the, um, the DG's latest report that the um, Global Designs Database now has about 11 million records. That's a 50% increase over 2018. Uh, and the Global Brands Database uh, now has about 40 million records, uh, which is a 40% increase over 2018. So that both seems great. I wonder, uh, Gregoire and Debbie, if you, if you could comment on that uh, and also specifically tell us about the AI Assisted Image Search Tool uh, which I find to be absolutely amazing, uh, but it seems like a lot of folks don't know it's there. I would let perhaps Debbie take the lead because that search tool is only if available to uh, for trademarks, aside from class 32 under Locarno, I think. Yeah, I, I would advise users to, to take a look and test the global brand database, especially the new AI feature. It provides much better hits by using the different filters now to, to find um, marks that might be in conflict with your mark, for example, for clearance searches. It's, it's difficult to, to show you from here, but um, there are different filters you can use, and the new filter would provide much better hits. So I would follow the tutorials on the website if I if I were you. Okay, is that tutorial something that we could send uh, perhaps a follow-up link uh, to, to our participants and our membership? Because I, I, I look at that uh, when I benefited. I, yeah. yeah, I'll send you some information later. Okay, that, that would be wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. And, and thanks uh, to all three of you for uh, uh, very informative uh, and timely uh, presentations.
uh, and thanks to all who submitted questions as well. Um, as we're now at time, we'll uh, move on to Xavier. Xavier, you've appeared on the screen, and uh, yes. please go ahead. Yes, thank you, John. Um, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's a real pleasure to uh, to uh, participate to this um, YPOE IPPI webinar, and I've been uh, asked to um, to give you an outlook about the the work of the Advisory Committee on Enforcement, the ACE, to use the English acronym, and also on specific WIPO initiative, which is the WIPO Alert Database. So please allow me to just uh, get into my presentation. <clears throat> just a second. All right. All right, the system is loading. All right, so here we are. So the Advisory Committee on Enforcement is the WIPOS Committee of Member States serving as the forum for policy dialogue on questions of IP enforcement and more broadly, building respect for, for IP. As the name indicates, it's an advisory committee. Uh, so in other words, there is no norm setting work which is uh, being performed within this committee since there is simply another body for that, uh, the Council for TRIPS in uh, the ambit of the World Trade Organization. But the advisory nature of the ACE facilitates the dialogue between the member states on experiences and practices in the field because in a way uh, there is no fear of any judgmental view by other member states when one member state presents its practice and, and experience uh, in the field. The ACE is a forum for member states as I said but there are of course observers from the public and the private sector including of course AI PPI. Now, we, we, uh, we observe actually a growing interest for the work of the ACE, both uh, with member states and among the observers. You have on this slide the indication of um, the, uh, the outfit of the last ACE session that took place in September of last year. Important uh, to bear in mind, all the work which is being done uh, in the ACE is based on written documents and those written documents are publicly available. You have the ICO link there. So there is a lot, a lot of information available in the six official languages of WIPO. As I said, we observe a growing interest uh, among both the member states and the observers. You you'll see here the graphics relating to the um, uh, rate of participation throughout the ACE sessions. Now, um, the th thing is that for some, some time now, since the 11th session of the ACE, there are four main topics which are being discussed um, in the ACE. In other words, four topics um, to which the member states of WIPO wanted to dedicate the time um, for the discussions within the ACE. First and foremost, there is the question of the awareness raising. Uh, that's important, uh, raise the awareness of the public to ensure that uh, they um, participate fully to a, to a culture of building respect for IP. Um, there is also uh, the legislative assistance and the capacity building activities, which are being provided by WIPO in the field of enforcement and you see the topic institutional arrangements concerning IP enforcement and balanced holistic and effective IP dispute resolution. A very broad um, topic, obviously, but that allows a lot of discussion between the member states on, on topical issues relating to, uh, to IP um, enforcement. For example, in the last year, um, we, we discussed uh, within this framework the coordination of IP enforcement, um, the, the coordination between the various um, stakeholders on IP enforcement, and we had contribution from, for, from Greece, Morocco, Brazil, the Republic of Korea, the USA, Spain. 
We discussed also new technologies on IP enforcement with presentation by Switzerland and EU, um, certainly of relevance uh, for you all. Um, a study um, uh, authored by Professor Mustard and Barrister Jane Lambert uh, was presented, a study on IP enforcement measures and especially anti-piracy measures in the digital environment. So this study is, is of course available for you to, to read. Um, we discussed arrangements to address online IP infringements, uh, the role of intermediaries on IP enforcement uh, issues with presentations by the Universal Postal Union, uh, Alibaba, Amazon, Facebook, Google, etc. Um, and, uh, and also a presentation on judicial and prosecutorial discretion in IP infringement proceedings including a contribution by Judge Hart of the uh, IP Enterprise Court in the UK about exercising discretion to grant additional damages under the UK Copyright Designs and Patent Acts. So you can see you have a flavor of uh, the, 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 the topical issues that are being discussed within the framework of the, of the ACE. So for the next session, um, if all goes well, it will be held uh, in October of, of this year. And again, uh, member states wanted to uh, continue the dialogue on, on these issues. Um, and so we will continue to discuss inter alia uh, enforcement coordination, new technologies, online IP infringements, also uh, the cross border effects of judicial injunctions, and important. The, the issue of damages because in this session of the ACE of 2018, actually, um, uh, of course, we, uh, we were aware that AIPPI um, made a study on the quantification of monetary relief uh, that led to the Sydney resolution. And we invited AIPPI to participate um, in the uh, 2018 session of the ACE uh, and AIPPI made a presentation. Now, this is of course uh, very important, taking into account that the, uh, the work you did in London relating to um, the issue of the damages for uh, acts of infringement other than sales is complementary to the work done in Sydney. So it looks um, uh, for us quite important to, uh, to offer the opportunity of AIPPI, if AIPPI so wishes, to participate again in the next ACE session and, uh, and uh, make a presentation relating to the work uh, done in, uh, uh, in London. So this is a, an open invitation to AI PPI. So this is uh, in a nutshell uh, what I wanted to say about um, the ACE. Now, um, there is something else I wanted to mention. Um, in the ACE, we discussed also, for example, um, the uh, infringing website list initiatives. And this is, this is quite uh, important, actually, because this is, uh, these are initiatives um, aimed at preventing paid advertising on copyright infringing websites. Um, as you probably know, online advertising is a major source of revenue for online operators of copyright infringing websites. And, um, you know, due to the complexity and difficulty to control the system of se selling online advertising, uh, legitimate brands owners may find their advertising appearing on, on pirate websites. And else, uh, these brand owners unwillingly contribute to funding copyright infringing websites. And because of the presence of their brands on those websites, it confers an aspect of legitimacy to the pirate websites. Um, and this, of course, is a problem, and it's a problem for the brand owners themselves, because in a way, when it appears that the website is copyright infringing, well, the mere fact that their brands appear on that website tarnish uh, the reputation of their brands. So this is an issue, and in some uh, member states of WIPO, um, they have uh, developed this initiative uh, of uh, gathering information uh, about copyright infringing websites. The, uh, the uh, gathering of, the, of this information is made by public authorities, and the public authorities 
share this information with the advertising industry, enabling uh, the advertising intermediaries to avoid placing or continuing placing ads on these websites. A well-known example uh, is the uh, UK initiative led by IPU, the um, Police IP Crime Unit of the City of London, which maintains such an infringing website list and uh, put it at the disposal of the advertising industry. Other member states have developed similar uh, infringing website lists initiative um, and still other uh, public authorities are involved in the blocking of pirate websites, such as the Italian AGCOM, the Co Italian Communications Regulatory Authority. What implies, of course, if we want to, to block a website, uh, that implies that you have collected information about the targeted infringing websites. Um, this has, these initiatives were, were presented um, in a previous ACE session, but of course those initiatives are national. And that's where um, WIPO, um, uh, in consultation with the member states, thought about developing an international uh, uh, initiative, which led to the WIPO alert database, which was also presented in the last ACE session. So what is it all about? It's basically um, a, the, the idea of gathering, of compiling uh, the national list of, uh, of copyright infringing websites and to put that in a secure online platform to which agencies um, of, uh, sorry, uh, the, the lists are uploaded by the uh, national uh, agencies, and these agencies are uh, so-called authorized contributors, uh, if you can see on, on, that, uh, on that slide, um, and approved uh, actors, authorized users of the advertising industry would be allowed to get access to this database and uh, in order to inform their decision on whether to place or not advertising advertisements on specific websites. So in other words, the idea is to have um, an international compilation of uh, the national list of um, infringing websites in order to facilitate things uh, also for the, for the users because you, you, you would have a kind of one-stop shop, if I may say so. So um, it, is, uh, it is very important to, uh, to, to uh, understand how it works. And here again, this is something very uh, important. Um, the member states keep the control of the database in the sense that the uh, contributors retain the discretion as to the disclosure of their lists on this uh, WIPO platform. Um, and they decide which, can, which users uh, can have access to their lists. So this is something very, very important. Um, and uh, it is uh, envisaged that later on the contributors will also provide um, a description of their process in identifying uh, infringing websites and that uh, that information will be uh, provided um, to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the public. So it is important also to bear in mind uh, that the respect for due process is assured by the member states. Uh, the responsibility of the list remains with member states and WIPO just compiles this information on this uh, database. So that is the way it, it works. Uh, perhaps just briefly, if you see um, this slide again, so the, the way it works, there is a letter of understanding between the contributors, meaning the public authorities, um, getting the, uh, these lists of IP infringing websites and uploading it on the WIPO platform. And there is a user agreement between a WIPO and the, uh, the uh, user who wish to get access 
to this platform. Again, uh, access is provided insofar as the contributors agree uh, um, with this uh, request. So that is the way uh, it is uh, being performed. So the WIPO alert is something being currently developed. We are really in the first weeks of uh, performance of the system. Uh, you can see on the slides uh, the, uh, the current uh, contributors and the current users. Of course, negotiations are ongoing. We hope for more, um, uh, for more collaboration and more uh, stakeholders taking part to the system. Um, more information will be provided, I speak in the future, um, on wipo.int slash alert. For the moment, if you go there, there is no information, but later on, more information will be provided for the general public to know how, how the system uh, works. But again, if you are interested um, by this uh, um, WIPO alert database, I certainly invite you to, uh, to read the document which was presented in the last ACE session. Okay, that was in a nutshell what I wanted to, uh, to present. Um, I thank you for your attention and um, I give the floor back to you, John. Javier, thank you very much for that uh, excellent summary of, of your work and thanks for all that you're doing um, on behalf of enforcement world, worldwide. Uh, thanks also for mentioning uh, AIPPI's resolutions. Um, the initial resolution from Sydney, uh, which related to quantification of damages and then the more um, the, the resolution from last year in London, which dealt with uh, damages for, for acts other than sales. Um, and, and indeed, as you mentioned, uh, I, I think th these are very, very useful studies from, from the standpoint of, of respect for IP and public policy. It, it seems logical that fear of paying damages discourages infringement and, uh, and thus would enhance respect for IP, uh, one would think. Um, at the same time, though, um, if one could potentially obtain damages at each stage of, say, manufacturing, importing, warehousing, etc., uh, in addition to sales, this might be viewed by the public as abusive uh, and might even backfire uh, in terms of respect for IP um, in the eyes of the public at large. So in this age where respect for IP is already tenuous in some circles, uh, what do you see as the proper balance of enforcement as a deterrent to infringement and reasonableness to help engender respect for the IP system overall? Well, that's uh, thank you for this question, John. It's a quite a, quite a very broad question, and I could develop that for 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 hours, not just for, for in a few minutes. So I will try to uh, to get to the uh, to the core of the matter. Um, first, as to the damages uh, themselves, of course, the benchmark is the principle enshrined in, in Article 45 of the TRIPS Agreement, um, which is that it is needed to compensate the prejudice suffered by the right holder and compensating him or her wholly, uh, but not more than that. Notwithstanding the issue of civil sanctions or treble damages, which might apply in some jurisdictions, uh, in some determined cases, the principle of fair and entire compensation is the cornerstone of the civil uh, remedy of damages, both in civil law and common law countries, right? Um, and I note, by the way, that in the London resolution of AIPPI itself, um, works is being made on, on, on this premise, basically, because uh, there is a call for the avoidance of double recovery, all right? Um, that's for the damages. Nevertheless, it's still difficult to, to determine what is the, the right balance, you know, and, and that's precisely uh, uh, one of the major difficulty of the, of the work you have done uh, uh, with the London study. Um, now, from a broader perspective, you are right uh, in considering that um, the challenge is to find the right balance between a sound system of IP enforcement as a deterrent to IP infringements and uh, without creating an anti-IP feeling. Um, and by the way, this is directly in line uh, with one of the WIPO strategic objectives, which is to foster international cooperation to build a sustainable environment of respect for IP. And of course, 
we, we all agree that IP enforcement in itself is essential to ensure the, the reliability of the system of IP protection. Um, without an effective IP enforcement system, well, IP protection would just be an empty shell, um, failing to encourage innovation, creation, and dynamism in the markets. And that's, of course, we all agree with that, the rationale of the IP enforcement as enshrined in part three of the TRIPS agreement. But of course, abuses of enforcement procedures or even a blind implementation of civil measures and remedies or where applicable um, criminal procedures and sanctions without, the, uh, without taking uh, properly into account the circumstances would have a detrimental effect. So how to deal with that and how to progress towards um, a sustainable culture of, of respect for IP more generally. Well, to start with, um, it has to be recalled that a sound and efficient IP enforcement system is only a part of the strategy to build respect for IP. It must be accompanied by other strategic elements. Uh, it is also important to work on preventive measure, not to work only on the enforcement side and on the side of the demand for IP infringing goods that implies working towards the awareness raising of the public. I mentioned in my presentation that that was one of the key topics being discussed within the framework of the ACE and that's exactly at the request of the member states because they do consider themselves that uh, where awareness raising is a key aspect uh, in any strategy of building respect for IP. On the side of the offer of IP infringing goods now, it's important to work also on measures which are, I think, complementary to pure IP enforcement mechanisms. And this is best illustrated, I think, through soft law initiatives, the development of voluntary agreements between right holders and intermediaries, specifically in the online world, uh, or initiatives such as uh, the uh, infringing website lists that I spoke about when I, when I talk about uh, WIPO alert. And all those kinds of initiatives and measures uh, are, by the way, of course, also topics that member states brought forward um, in the discussions within the framework of the ACE. And then, of course, there, there are indeed the enforcement mechanisms themselves. And here, it's perhaps important to, um, to remember, to recall the word you use in your question, uh, which is the word of, of balance. And this is a key point. After all, Article 7 of the TRIPS Agreement, which is this, this provision which captures the philosophy of IP enforcement, uh, calls uh, for um, conceptualizing IP protection and IP enforcement in a balanced way between the various interests at stake, the interests of the right holders, of course, but also the interest of the users and the interest and the general interest uh, at large. And this implies choices, choices to be made by the lawmakers when they are implementing part three of the TRIPS agreement and adapt it to local circumstances. And I think in particular to the various options open to the uh, member state of the World Trade Organization in uh, the provisions of part three of the TRIPS agreement. But this is only one aspect. Another aspect of balance um, appears through many of the provisions themselves of part three of the TRIPS agreement, uh, when they call for the proportionality of the measures to be ordered by the civil or the criminal judge, or when they permit to order measures in appropriate cases. Often we see those terms in appropriate cases in the, in the TRIPS agreement. Uh, and that is to say the role of the judge in implementing IP enforcement measures, in ensuring the proportionality of the measures and the remedies cannot be uh, emphasized enough, I think. And I must add, if uh, the judges have to ensure proportionality, of course, the role of the attorneys at law in the course of litigation when discussing measures to be ordered by the judge is also of, of key, uh, of key uh, relevance. And so to, to sum up, um, there is, of course, no one size fits all and a kind of magical approach as to how best to ensure the balance 
between enforcement measures and reasonableness to contribute to the culture of respect for IP. Uh, it is through the efforts of all the stakeholders, policy makers, lawmakers, law enforcement officials, judges, attorneys, right holders, working on the various aspects that I've mentioned, that progress towards building respect for IP could be achieved. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, we, we, we all have a lot of work to do, I think. I have a, a related question from one of our uh, attendees who represents herself as the WFEO representative, and I think that's the World Federation of Engineering Organizations, if I'm correct. Uh, and she asks, how can NGOs such as hers uh, and others working with the industry and in education help develop IPR in the developing world? Uh, we have a large network of engineers and scientists in all innovation areas and would like to contribute to fostering a sustainable IPR system. Yeah, so I guess this, this question relates more to the question of, uh, of raising awareness through education in the developing world. A lot of initiatives are being taken um, also in WIPO uh, and with the local partners. Um, um, so I invite certainly the, uh, the participants um, to, uh, to look at the documents which have been presented within uh, uh, the uh, last ACE sessions on this topic of awareness raising and she will see a lot of initiatives which have been developed and WIBO itself is um, as I say working a lot on those issues with local partners of course it is important to um, to avoid duplication of work so um, I would certainly invite this participant to liaise uh, with us further with our division and we would uh, we would discuss that further but the point is the following point um, to be to be to be uh, remember is, is this one in the developing world a lot of work is being done and a lot of initiatives are being developed to raise the awareness of the public so it's certainly not uh, just something for the developed world a lot a lot a lot of work is being uh, done in the developing world as well so it's good if we can coordinate uh, the efforts in, the, in that regard Great. Well, thank you very much, uh, Xavier. That was very interesting. Um, and we all look forward to uh, supporting you in, in your continuing work. Uh, and and uh, thanks for all that you do. Uh, it remains uh, for me only to uh, thank all of the speakers uh, for this wonderful session. This really has been uh, educational, uh, informative, and enjoyable. Um, the sun is now up in Idaho behind me, as you can see. Um, and uh, so it's, uh, it's morning here. And uh, again, I, I want to thank all of you and, and thank the participants. And Arno, I'll, I'll pass it over to you for any closing words. Thank you very much, John. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to all the speakers for their excellent presentations. Uh, it takes a lot of guts to speak in, in front of your computer home screen under the constant threat of, of, you know, like wives, husbands, other family members or pets bursting into the room. Uh, and you manage brilliantly. This would be the time now to hand out flowers, but uh, different from PCT filings, we're not yet in a position to send them electronically, but we will make sure that uh, in the next few days, weeks, or, or, or probably even months, when you, when you reach your office the next time, uh, there will be a, a, a very small uh, token of appreciation waiting for you. Uh, thanks also for, for WIPO, to WIPO and in particular the, the NGO and the industry relation uh, team, uh, Tom and Christopher for uh, making this possible. We're looking forward to, to additional editions of, of this format in the, in the hopefully near future. And if you allow me to quickly address all those uh, uh, webinar participants who are not yet AIPPI members, and I was surprised there are actually a lot of them. Um, yeah, if, if you're interested in getting a member or becoming a member of AIPPI, please do get in touch with us. Uh, the fact that you uh, stayed with us for two hours now, it indicates that you're interested in IP and we are open to everybody interested in IP. So please contact us or contact uh, uh, our national groups in your destination country. Uh, some of them offer very interesting membership discounts and uh, we, they would be happy to introduce you to our services 
and 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 uh, what, what we offer to you. Uh, yeah, finally, let me thank all the participants of this webinar and uh, please stay safe, but uh, stay connected to your peers. And uh, I hope we will no longer have to focus soon on protecting ourselves, but can continue to protect IP. Thank you very much on that note. Goodbye. <laughs>